right. Hey, good morning. Great to see y'all. Grab your Bible. We're going to end up in Matthew here in a moment. Um, man, just worshiping the Lord together it reminds me how good it is. Why we do this? For lots of reasons. He's worthy of our praise. But when we come together, even as like noted in his prayer, um, we're reminded again of the big story we find ourselves in. It's a, it's a different story than we're prone to live out that God really is in control of our lives. And some of you, I'm seeing again, some of you have been gone for a long time, you're back, or lots of different reasons. People are out and about. I'm meeting a lot of new people. If you're new here today, we welcome you. We're so glad that you're here. We've had a lot of people joining our church today. And um, I went and, and we have a group in uh, Discover Park Cities right now, you know, which happens periodically along the way. Uh, new members and people who are just learning, how can I get plugged in here? So watch for that always over and over again. So we are in another story, a different story. Uh, and the Lord Jesus reminds us of the story that we now find ourselves in. And the thing you're going to hear me say on repeat today is, is this. I'm going to challenge you, and it, this will make sense as we go. Change the story. Change the story that you are in in terms of relationships. We're talking about relationships. Last week we talked about anxiety, and this week we're going to talk about we're going to talk about a bit about anger, about retaliation. But really, it's something for all of us um, as we think about our personal relationships. We've been walking through Matthew and what it means to live under the the lordship of our King Jesus, to live in His kingdom. He's changed the story for us. I'll set it up this way. A couple of weeks ago. Um, I was reading an article in The Atlantic. I don't always read The Atlantic, but this article caught my, caught my eye. It's by Jonathan Haidt. I'll point you to it, by the way, if you can find it without having to subscribe, if you're not a subscriber. You may be able to find this. Um, fascinating article. Long, um, intriguing read. Um, Jonathan Haidt is a moral sociologist. Uh, he's, I think, a Yale Penn grad. He's at NYU. But he's, he's written a couple of books. One uh, he wrote some time ago called The Coddling of the American Mind, which is a fascinating read. Uh, I point you to that one as well. And a book called The Righteous Mind, where he says that the reason that we can't get along um, any, like in any culture, it, but particularly he focuses in on American culture with our you know, conservative and liberals. We kind of run to politics all the time. But why there's such a divide, and I have to tell you that we know this is happening. Some have said we live in this anger culture now. Um, NPR did a study recently that said 84% of Americans are angrier now than we were a generation ago. So this low-grade anger um, that is happening in our culture comes to play in our personal lives. Haidt says that the problem is that we have two different, very different moral frameworks, he calls them. Um, and so we can't really understand the other. And, and he goes on, th this article, by the way, the title of the article is After Babel, Why the Past Ten Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid. And he explains why it is that we seem so confused, and he explains why some of you know people in your life, maybe extended family or something, who you know are highly educated, you know, like they're in your tribe, if you will. But over the past couple of years, you're like, you've lost your mind. Like, I don't even understand, like on that issue or something. Like, I can't even, I don't know how this, and he says that the thing that was most intriguing to him, he reads this story, um, which is brief, you know, the Tower of Babel story. And, and, he, and he said what caught his imagination was this. Where God says, let's go down and confound their language so they can't understand each other. And he goes, oh my gosh, that's exactly what's happened. Now he comes at this brilliant mind um, as a sociologist. And he says what's happened is, and we all know this, but, and we've talked about this some, but what's happened, he goes back to 2009, 2014. We don't have to go, you can read the details. But he marks dates where things happened in regard to social media the like button and viral stuff and our news sources and, and even algorithms that have pushed us now to the, to the margins, to the sides. I, I find this fascinating because now he says it's not just enough to be against the other person. And we're going to talk about personal relationships here. It's not just enough to be like, these are my tribe. These are my people. You guys are whacked throwing rocks at the other group. It's not just enough to do that. Now what's happened, if you find yourself somewhere as a centrist of sorts, like, let's have a conversation about this. Even leaning towards the other way. Or you know what? That's a good point they're making over here. 
Or, hey, I think we've got some weakness in our, in our tribe. If you do that, now you're canceled and pushed out. And he says what's happened is the extremists are driving the narrative now. And so if you're, if you're a kind of centrist or seek reconciliation and like let's all talk about this. I mean like me. Like I find myself more of a centrist in a lot of different issues. Not because I'm a pastor. But because this is the place where um, the contest of ideas, uh, where different diverse thought comes. And in a democracy, this is why he writes this essentially. He's saying that our democracy is under attack. Because if we can't have civil discourse somewhere in the middle where creative ideas and truth you hope will prevail, and, and, and where we, we come up with, in terms of politics, you come up with the best policies for the common good of people. Now, he, he says that's, that's not happening anymore. And he writes it to say this is a threat to the American experiment and why we live in the greatest country on the planet. Because we, but now we've lost this ability, and he says, man, it's... It's scary. Now, he ends with some hopeful points of here's how we might be able to change this thing. But, but what, what's happened is instead of this vision that God has given us as his people, um, we're now seeing that, that we, we have a hard time having healthy dialogue. I see this in our church all the time. What I mean is I was with a search committee this week. We have groups that are now meeting, um, discipleship pastor, high school pastor. We've we got groups all the time. And I see diverse groups of people coming together with Christ as Lord and King and all of us moving towards the same direction, praying together with, with different ideas, different points of, of life, different ages and such. And, and I see it work beautifully in the church. But how does this work in our personal relationships? Because that's where I want us to go. And I want you to think about personal relationships you're in, and specifically, maybe some people, someone that you struggle to love. Now, what's going to come into play as well is those who you're closest with. I think those of us who are married or you have a roommate or within your own family, I want you to think about people that you want to love well. And maybe you struggle to love. Maybe some of you, as I've talked to others this morning, you're estranged from someone. And like you're going, I don't know how it got this far. And this happens in most families, and it happens for a lot of us. But this is going to be a very practical teaching because Jesus is the one who's giving us this truth to, to, um, to help us to have relationships that honor him. Okay, so Matthew chapter 5 is where we're going to be. Jesus has been, now this is within the context of the Sermon on the Mount. He starts with the Beatitudes. And this is the king who's offering this kingdom manifesto. This is how you live in the kingdom. And it is radical stuff. So radical. Jesus has said up to this point, he's essentially, he's the one who started it all. He's saying he's come to change the story. He's come to change the story, meaning where we'll get to the text here in a moment. Um, to place it in context, he says, hey, you thought that it was about your righteousness getting to God. And that's without, you know, without grace, that's all we know, right? Like religion. I got to be good enough to get to God and I'll find heaven or salvation ultimately. And I'll be right. I'll be righteous. That's how we say it. Uh, and Jesus comes and he says, um, that's not going to happen. In fact, he says in verse 20, we're going to be at verse 21. But to set it up, he says this. To summarize his teaching to this point, this driving truth. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is radical stuff. And saying it. Ha, about the scribes and Pharisees, who were the you know, picture of holiness and righteousness. But notice he says, exceeds them. They're out as well. Jesus is trying to say, nobody can be good enough. The gospel becomes the worst news and the best news you've ever heard in your life. The worst, most depressing, hopeless word. I can't be good enough. Jesus steps in to change the story and he goes, yep, but I can be. I am the way. Trust in me as your substitute. I'll take your punishment for all of your sin upon the cross. And you can't by faith receive that you're totally forgiven, fully loved by me. Now let's go. Let's live this life in, out of this new identity. So he gets to verse 21, what are called six antitheses. Um, they, they are comparative statements or really contrasting statements. Here's how he, look, look at this. Here's how he's come to change the story. Some of y'all know this. He's got six of these. You've heard it said, but I say to you. 
and again, this is radical stuff. Why well, he got in trouble over time. This is heresy, if you will, to say, hey, the law, ladies talking about the law. This is it. We all know the law. Come on, the Ten Commandments and, and other. You've heard it said, but as soon as he says that, you know, Pharisees, leaders, anybody's going, wait, what, wait, did he say but? Like, is he, is he changing something here? What is he talking about? And what he's talking about, he's going to get to the heart of the law, not changing anything, but instead getting to the heart of the law. Jesus is telling us that, that there's a different way to live. You know, I talked to a lot of people in the past couple of years, and maybe you've read or, or been in these conversations too, people talking about deconstructing their faith, right? This deconstruction of faith, which is often based on a spiritual past or bad theology or a bad experience in church. And church hurt is a real thing. Um, I mean, we've all been, if you hang out in church long enough, you've all, we've all been hurt by the church. We bump up against each other, but we've been hurt uh, by the church, meaning like a person, like a member or a leader or a pastor or someone. But Jesus offers the ultimate deconstruction here. <laughs> when, when he says, you've heard it said, okay, but this way is going to wear you out and there's going to be a lot of hurt involved if you go this route. But I say to you, See, all of deconstruction is to lead us to a reconstruction, if you will, of a more beautiful picture of, of Jesus and his grace. Because our faith is not an institution. It's not in a person. It's not in a leader. It's not in a family member or, or some member of the church. Our faith is in Christ and him alone who doesn't change. And so then in Matthew 5, Jesus offers this, the, the ultimate deconstruction. Look at this, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, okay, this is the fifth commandment, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But, they're like, yeah, that's truth. And he says, but, I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Like, what? Wait, what? He takes this all the way to the heart. Here's what Jesus is going to teach us today. Here's what he's saying here and over and over again through these antitheses. Obeying God's commandment is not simply about an outward action. It's about an inward attitude. In fact, you can obey the action and your heart be far from God. And this is what Jesus wants to get to. Here it is. This, this, is, the, this is the picture all day long in, in the sermon and all day long. Vertical relationship with God is inextricably tied to my horizontal relationships with others. In fact, I could say you worship God by, yes, honoring him, by loving others. First commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor with the Christ-like kind of love. This is what Jesus is getting to. He's saying, um, I agree with your commandment. I don't agree with how you've defined murder. He says murder runs deeper than that. And, he, and the word in the, where it talks about insult there, in the ESV it's translated this. Other translations have this word raka. Maybe you've heard this before. It's a, an Aramaic term, which is actually in the text. That's probably better translated when somebody says raka. Um, and the word's idiot. It's when, you, when you're pridefully, arrogantly pronouncing someone as less than you are, it's just an idiot, lack any, any kind of intelligence. And then it says, there's two words here. Then he says, or anyone says, you fool. I remember when I was young, I heard somebody tell me, you know when you say fool, you go to hell. I mean, you know that, right? The word is moros. Where you get the word moron? So it could be translated moron. When you say, you're a moron, which is, which is again, here's what's happening. You're devaluing a person. Here it is. You're dehumanizing the person. In essence, you're killing. It's like, you're dead to me. You're killing. That's murder. You're not honoring them as one who has been created in the image of God, whether you agree with them or not. Or even if they come at you with something, okay, I'm not going to respond that way. We're going we're to talk about that this morning here a bit. But, but think about this. The most common way that we express destructive anger is through our words. And that's what Jesus is getting to here. In our words, angry insults, expressing disdain, dehumanizing a person. And we do this with our spouses, with our, we can do it with our children. And Jesus says, let's just check your heart. Okay, so the first thing I want you to see, we're going to be pursuing certain things this morning. Three things. First, pursue influence over insult. All right, if you're 
taking notes. We're going to talk about pursuing reconciliation over uh, retaliation. And we're going to talk about pursuing readiness, living this life of preemptive grace over retribution. You apply these points to your life that we're going to walk through today. The Jesus teaching, not mine. I'm doing my best to, to help us understand it further. This will change your life. This will change relationships that you're in. And I want you to think about relationships. Stacy and I have been talking about this, even in our marriage, about how powerful this is. To not simply do, you know, would you do this thing for me? Yes, I'll do this thing. But have a, to have a heart the whole time going, I don't want to be doing this. I'm doing it. I'm obeying the law, I guess. But I don't want to be doing this. That's what Jesus is getting to. Okay, He's getting to a heart of love. So we're pursuing influence because he's saying, what's the end game here? The end game is to honor God, love God, while we love others in our relationships. Very practical teaching. Now, you might be thinking right away, isn't there a righteous anger? Like, can I not be angry about anything? Because when I think about anger, um, some of you would be like me. I don't consider myself an angry person. I don't get angry, really. Um, But then I thought, no, I'm kind of angry about certain things. I get passionate about certain things. In fact, your anger can point you to your calling often. When it's injustice or something that you see that's got to be fixed, it's got to be made right. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 4, it says, be angry, but don't sin. So is this contradicting what Jesus says? Look, go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. Okay, we're going to talk about this. That's a, that's a element, key element here. And don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. I mean, Paul puts a time frame on this. Like 12 hours or less. Don't go to bed. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. Don't have this incessant ongoing anger or the devil's going to have a foothold in your life. This is so important. Psalm 711, it says this. I read this this week. It says, our God is a just judge and he's angry throughout the day. I was like, what? Some translations say God is just in every way and he's angry all day long. Some people, now, I think it could be translated differently, because some people um, think that God's that way. Like, he's always upset with me. He's just kind of this undercurrent of, he's always mildly upset with me all the time. Some of us have a relationship. And you, you talk about running to your father. You're not running to father. You're running away from the father. Because you misunderstood this. What, what even that says, what that, that verse says is God is just. He's a judge and he's always right. Nobody gets away from with anything before God, and he's already enacting judge, judgment all the time. In other words, he, his wrath, his holy reaction to sin, is always at work, and this, that's what it's really saying. He's already in charge and sovereign over all things, and we pay the price when we don't live according to the way he's called us to live. Anger gives a foothold to Satan. Jesus got angry, right? He flipped over the tables uh, in the temple. Remember that? When he sees God being dishonored, people being cheated. Uh, he, he called the Pharisees serpents and hypocrites. He was mad at the religious elite, which is interesting. Here's the difference. Here's one way to make the difference. Righteous anger is when you're concerned about injustice towards other people and the dishonoring of God. Unrighteous anger is is concerned only with my personal uh, injustice. When people hurt or insult, offend me. Now we're at, now we're coming at it, you know. So there's a difference there. Only Jesus has done this perfectly, demonstrated God's righteous anger. When others are mistreated, Jesus was like a, like a roaring lion. When he was mistreated, he was like a gentle lamb. And he calls us to live the same. In fact, in 1 Peter 2.23, 2.23, listen to this. It says, when he was maligned, he was, he, was, uh, he was like a gentle lamb. He did not answer back. Where he, was, where he suffered, and when he suffered, he, he threatened no retaliation, but committed himself to God who judges justly. In our personal relationships, we, it's an act of faith for us to trust God. Truth will prevail. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. There's often a time where I'm just not, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to be silent. I could say much. Not going to say it. Because I'm trusting God. 
And, and there, that's an act of faith. So look at what it says. Now he goes uh, to this verse 23. Look at this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Uh, on Easter Sunday, I said, uh, Jesus had two verbs in his vocabulary, if you were with us. Come and go. Here he says, no, go, then come. Go be reconciled, then come back. Again, you see how inextricably tied our worship of God and relationship with others is. You can't separate them. You've heard it said that the, the, the shortest distance between two points is, is a straight line. I could argue here, Jesus is saying, no, no, no. The shortest distance to God is going through another person that you've, you need to reconcile with. This is why I've wondered if we really applied this in my sermon right now, some of us at times would be getting up going, I got to go. I'm out. Sorry. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I got to go. I got to go text somebody. I got to make a phone call. I got to go make things right. One commentator said people would be at the altar in, in Jerusalem and what they'd have to do, they'd go miles. They'd have to go to another city. They didn't have phones. They didn't have a way to connect. They would leave and then come back if you're going to apply this. So here's the challenge for us today. Who is it for you? Who in your life do you need to reconcile with? Maybe you don't feel like it's resolved. Maybe they've hurt you or you've hurt them. And I'm not telling you to call somebody today and go, hey, I've been upset with you for two years. And I'm just coming to you because I just need to make things right. I haven't liked you at all since that time you said that. I just wanted you to know. Just trying to make things right. I'm not saying that. I'm saying to, to love them. And it might mean, hey, let's get coffee this week. And maybe you talk about the issue. Maybe it's just a function of you making the first move. That's grace. That's the radical way to change the story in, in, in our relationships. So Jesus is saying here, the same grace that's been extended to you, offered to others. Here's the, here's the principle. Pursue re reconciliation over retaliation. Verse 24, he says, be reconciled with that person. This is an intentional oneness. It's an, it's an active love. It, it's, it's peace over power in a relationship. Like, I'm going to hold this over you. No, 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 no. You're not anymore. It's mercy over justice. Like the guy who said, I wanted to forgive. I was going to forgive. I was so close to forgive, but I couldn't forgive because I'm too just. It's the law of retaliation. It's the law of retribution. You see, look at verse 25. Come to terms quickly. He gives us real practical advice here. With your accuser, while you are going with him to court. Now, it's important to understand here, he's offering a kind of parable. Okay, real life to be applied on a spiritual level in our relationships. So you're going to court with you. And by the way, you've already done something wrong. You've done something wrong. You're going to court lest your accuser hand you over to the judge. Okay, the judge makes the judgment to the guard. Then the guard puts you in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. What Jesus is saying, he's showing us how conflicts can escalate if they're not resolved quickly. You see that? Come to terms quickly with your accuser. And again, this is when you have done wrong. Now, this is so important. Most of our challenges in relationships would end. Here's how you change the, change the story. If we simply said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was wrong. This is, this is the confessing your sin to one another scripture. Most of our challenges, in, and this is, this is true in our closest relationships. Stacey and I are talking about this this week. Um, to, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that attitude I had. I did that thing, but I did it with a heart that was, and you could sense it. I wasn't real loving. I did the thing, but this is what Jesus is getting. He's saying, again, change the story. How do you change the story? He's offering this, this figure, figures, uh, figures of speech where he's saying, this is going to escalate. And if you play this out spiritually, he says, this, this leads all the way to a life of estrangement, a life that's not a life of worship. You end up in hell, the ultimate prison. You can't pay your way out. You can't get out. And there's all kinds of ways to lead to death and hell in relationships. It's like this, it's like this time of the year if you're pulling weeds okay, in the spring. A waste of a lifetime. 
by the way. But if you're pulling weeds and um, you come across one like, whoa, hey, hey, this, you know, a little sapling that's coming up, maybe it's an acorn or something that some squirrel, you know, dropped in, in the, uh, put down in there in the, in the winter. And you're going, oh, see, it's, it's got roots that start to grow. If you don't pull that sapling out, it's going to keep growing. It's going to become a tree. Roots are going to go deep. Then you've got, you, you're going to have a hard time pulling it out. Then there's damage. Pull that little sapling out. Pull it out while it's, it's new. End it. And the way that we end it is preemptive grace. Here's our problem. We're always waiting for the other person to make the first move. Well, you know, you weren't that kind. I mean, I wasn't that kind, but you weren't kind. That's the law of retaliation. That will keep on going, and it will only escalate. And Jesus says, here's the principle. Resolve conflict in relationships quickly. If you can practice this, it's not going to grow. And again, in Ephesians 4, Paul gives us a time frame. He says, okay, before the sun goes down, take care of this. Now, in keeping with our theme of reconciliation and relationships, we're going to jump to verse 38 because in verse 27, he says, you've heard it said, um, uh, you know, don't, don't commit adultery, which I think is the sixth commandment. And then uh, he says, but I'm telling you that lust is equal to adultery. He's getting to the heart of the matter. Then he says with oaths, verses 33 through 37, you can't keep God out of any transaction in your life. That your yes be yes, your no be no. Every conversation, every commitment you make, every business deal, you can't remove God from the center of it. Let your words be true. That's, that's the kind of don't bear false witness, uh, um, you know, where, where he says, you've heard this, but now I'm telling you this. Look at verse 38. He says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. This is, this again, the law of, re, uh, of reciprocity. Every judge was required to apply, and, and he's going to lay out real situations, um, to apply the law of reciprocity. That is to say, um, we would say the punishment fits the crime, right? So we're to exact retribution, not more than is, is necessary, but not less than either. And then he says, but I say to you, do not resist the evil, the one who is evil. But in, if, if, if anyone slapped you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek also. Now, we've seen some slapping in our culture of late, have we not? Uh, you see, Will Smith, um, you know, Chris Rock slap. I mean, that's old news. But um, like on the, on the world stage, we're seeing some slapping. But here's what's interesting here. Um, if you're going to slap any left, left-handers here, lefties here, you're anointed by God. Praise the Lord. Are y'all, y'all are both lefties. Y'all are married and you're left-handed. You have children. Are they left-handed? Ha! See there? Well, I don't know what that means. I, I don't know. But, um, but here's the thing. Here's what's interesting. Notice he says right cheek. If I slap, if I'm going right-handed on you, you slapping me, I'm, you're slapping me on the left cheek. Have y'all seen this, by the way? It's a sport, slapping sport. Have you seen this? It's nuts. Um, it's a slap. Like you're, sla- you're, sla- you're standing there, you take a slap. They about knock each other out. But, he's, but here's what he's talking about. If I'm going to slap you on your right cheek, I've got to backhand you, right? Like, Psh! that's the ultimate insult. Like, talk to the hand. Psh! Like, that is the ultimate insult. I guess Will should have gone, you know, backhanded um, Chris Rock. I don't know that he did. I don't know which way he went. But what, what, what's happening here is it, this is the ultimate, again, an insult, But what's happening, and we always see that it's the wild law of retaliation, it's called, where here's what's going to happen. Human nature is such. You slap me, I'm going to slap you back in a little bit harder or a word, a little bit more. Then that's going to respond with another, right? Then fists. Then it's an all-out brawl. How do you end this law of the human nature? Look at what he says. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, give him your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go go in two miles. Give to them who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow. You see, he's saying here that there's only one way to end it. Because if we apply the law of reciprocity and retaliation in personal relationships, it's what Gandhi said. He was right. An eye for an eye makes the whole world go blind. 
And the only way to end it, this is radical stuff. The way to change the story is, is this. Pursue readiness over retaliation. And here's what I mean. To be ready to serve, ready to respond to, to insult with love. Who lives this way? Jesus. And anybody who seeks to follow him. Anybody who wants to live like him. This is how we change the world. You see, when you enter into this, this kind of tit for tat, this, how do you change the law of reciprocity? How do you end the wild law of retaliation? Again, you change the story. And the way to change the story, and it doesn't have to be just physical, and I've got to say this, if there's physical abuse going on, in your relationship with someone, you need to get out of that. We want to help you today. I'm not kidding. And if you're the abuser, you need help right away. And we want to help you with that. If you know someone who needs help, friends, we want to intervene. You talk about the holy wrath of God. We need to step in there and say, this has got to be made right. And you need out. But for, for a lot of us, it's words again. Might be an attitude, even in the healthiest relationship. It's, it's attitude, and it's, well, I'm, I'm kind of bitter about that. I'm kind of angry with you about that. I know you are, but I'm not, so I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to talk to you either. Well, I'm kind of bitter. I'm getting more bitter. And then, bam, the next day something blows up, and you go, whoo, how did we get there? Because it was escalating all the while. How do you end it? How do you end the narrative? It's by meeting the other person with grace when they've insulted you, with love. Not retribution, not retaliation. And you might say, well, so is Jesus calling us to just be like doormats? I mean, is that what this is? The better question is, what is really the full meaning of non-resistance or non-retaliation? What, what is the meaning of grace? It means that we make the first move. And where all this goes, friends, by the end of this chapter, he says, here it is. You've heard it said to hate your enemies, you know, and love your neighbors, love your friends. Jesus says, but in my kingdom, love your enemies. Love a spouse who just said something unkind to you. Love, love that family member that, that you're estranged from. Reach out to them. This is the way of grace. And he then offers these three examples, the slap, the tunic, the extra mile. And he says, this is how you change the narrative. Of course the narrative is going to go escalation, slap, punch in the face, big brawl, all-out fight, estrangement. Now we don't love each other. Now we can't even talk anymore. Of course it's going to go that route. That's human nature. That's sin nature. He says, in the story, change the narrative by letting love step in because we're not called simply to meet evil with evil. We're called to meet evil with love. It's why Dr. Martin Luther King said, darkness can't, be, can't, can't overcome darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Love changes the story. Where are you going to apply this? In your life. Because Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. If you're married, this might have been read at your wedding ceremony. Love bears all things. Believes all things, hopes the best in all things, endures all things. Love wins. And it's a matter of trusting the Lord. That's how you change the story. It's, it's, it's influence over insult. It's, it's reconciliation over retaliation. And it's living with a readiness over retribution. Will you do it this week? Watch for it. Some of y'all know I'm going to be in a meeting this week, or I'm going to be at that thing, or I'm going to, do, or my spouse is going to. They trigger me when they do that thing, or my kids making me crazy, and I'm watching for that. Preemptive grace. I'm watching. I'm going to love them. I'm going to get cut off in traffic. So I'm, you idiot! Oh, I just. Oh my gosh! And maybe you don't say it out loud, but that's it. We do it. We even watch someone on TV and it has a little R by the name, a little D by the name. You're nuts. You don't even know them. You know, I mean, it's that kind of disdain that comes at people. Instead, we're eager. We're watching for opportunities this week to be insulted. And instead of meeting hate with hate, it's going to be met with love. Who does this? Jesus does it. 
And he calls us to do the same. And so before we go today, I want us to have a time of prayer and commitment. And we're going to share in the Lord's Supper together. To remember, he's the one. Watch this. While we were yet sinners, sons and daughters of disobedience, insulting him, rebelling against him, slapping him in the face, placing him on a cross, he died for us, gave his life for us. That's where it starts. He's changed the story. Now we get to do the same. And so I want you to reach down um, under your chair there. The band's going to come out because we're going to sing a song to remind us before we go. Um, of what this is all about and the, the love that's come to us. But we wanted to just come to this point where we share in the Lord's Supper together. And I'm just challenging us all to change the story, okay? So let's do this before we um, partake as, as the, the band comes out and gets us, gets us rolling here. Let's, um, let's bow our heads and, and close our eyes right now. Would you do that? Um, because I want you to think about how you're going to apply this message. It's one thing to hear me um, unpack the Word of God and, and bring some application. It's, it's quite another thing for the Spirit to do so in your heart right now. And so every person hearing my voice, hear the voice of God in your heart right now. By His Spirit, let Him speak to you. You've already been thinking, how will you apply this this week? With whom will you make the bold move, a courageous move to reconcile? And again, maybe it's just to love. Maybe you're not bringing up the past again. You're just going to love them. And they're going to know that there's grace there. Who is it? And friend, if you're here today and you've never received the grace of Christ, by faith you can make a decision to trust in him. Give him your life right now. Give him your heart. Say, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give you my life. Thank you for taking on my punishment. Thank you for ending the law of reciprocity and punishment, even violence that should have come to me. The very wrath of God upon my sin. It came upon you. Thank you for changing my story. Now help me to change the stories that I find myself in. And we'll bring you glory through it all. 